In the last video, I talked about symmetry under time translation, and today we'll talk about symmetry under space translation. Okay, imagine if you have a system which is, I mean, imagine a system that is um, isolated from everything else. Let's say there are several particles in that in that system which are interacting with each with each other, and that system is not influenced by anything else. Then if you take that system as a whole and displace it to some another location, okay, everything that is happening within the system will remain unaffected. Okay, so uh, you will not be able to say whether the system was here or here when you did the experiment. Okay, so that's the symmetry which we are talking about. And uh, what I'll do is I'll start by a simple example uh, to uh, appreciate what um, we are trying to say and the simple example is that of two particles which are interacting with each other okay and I imagine that both the particles are only in let's say can live only in the x, uh, x axis only along the x axis okay so the the system lives only in one dimension I mean one dimensional space that's what I uh, mean so let's have a look at this one So here is the system. Okay. So that's your that's the x axis, some origin O, and your um okay somehow it feels nicer if you have color let's see you have a particle here okay and another particle here let's say the coordinates are x1 and x2 and their masses are m1 and m2 okay so how many degrees of freedom does this system have? What do you think? Meanwhile, I'll choose make this black in color. Okay. So this system clearly has two degrees of freedom, two particles each allowed to move only in along the x-axis. Okay. So there are two degrees of freedom. Okay, that's good. Let's write down the kinetic energy and the potential energy to um, construct the Lagrangian, okay? So your T is half M one X one dot square plus half M two X two dot square. Okay, and I choose a special kind of a potential for uh, this problem. I say that the potential is of the following form. Let's see what it is. So half k x2 minus x1 minus a square. Okay. So what I'm imagining is that these two particles are, let's say, connected by um, a spring of constant k. Okay. And the, um, um, how, how do you say it? The unstretched length of the spring is a. Okay. So the spring length is a. There's no force in on either of the particles. The moment you uh, stretch or compress, meaning x2 minus x1 becomes different from A, then there is a force and that's the spring constant. Now this may look like a simple example with two masses and a spring, but you'll see later, um, or maybe you already know, that this is a very good approximation for real systems. So you'll encounter many system, many systems in which their constituents will to first degree of approximation interact in such a manner okay if you do not know this already we'll have uh, later occasions to talk about this but nevertheless we um, I mean anyhow we are going to choose such a potential for our system let it let um, let me write down here okay, let me just write down whatever I have said here so uh, we are imagining as if the two masses uh, 
are connected by a spring of constant k. I hope that's clear from here. Okay, that's uh, x two minus x one is the separation between these two, right? These two masses. And uh, if you subtract a from it, let me write down what a is first. Then I'll a is the unstretched length of the spring. R I N G. Okay. So if x2 minus x1 is different from a, it means that either it is compressed or stressed. So there is a force. Okay. Now, um, okay. You see, there are no constraints on this system. So the Cartesian coordinates are uh, uh, good. You, you can use them as your. Uh, coordinates for writing down Euler Lagrange equations, so there is no problem with that. Um, but I will use a different set of coordinates other than um, the Cartesian to demonstrate the power of using some good coordinates. Okay, that's what I want to do. So I will choose instead of the Cartesian coordinates, which uh, as I said are perfectly good because of um, them being independent of each other. Let me choose the following. Let me choose choose the following to be the generalized. Choose the generalized coordinates to be to be following. So one coordinate I call it small q, which will be x two minus x1 and another coordinate I call capital Q which I will call m2 x2 plus m1 x1 I choose them I choose them because I can do so let's say if you don't want to choose it you want to choose the generalized coordinates to be x2 minus x1 and another one to be x2 plus x1 you can do so okay there's no problem with that but I want to show why this choice is really a fantastic choice and you'll see soon why um, let me see okay maybe I should go to the next page so take those coordinates and invert them now okay so you determine x1 and x2 in terms of small q and capital Q that's what you have to do and you should do the following exercise and check that indeed you get this result. So you get x1 is capital Q minus m2 small q over m1 plus m2 and your x2 turns out to be q plus capital Q plus small m1 sorry capital Q plus m1 small q over m1 plus m2 okay so that should be easy let's check whether this is correct so you should you should do this it's minor trivial algebra nevertheless do it let's check whether this is fine okay after always do a check after you have done some algebra and let's see what that is let's check whether x2 minus x1 comes out to be q okay that's what should happen so I calculate x2 minus x1. So we both have m1 plus m2 in the denominator. Um, m1 plus m2. And let's see what's in the numerator. x2 is this q plus m1 q. m1 small q minus x1. So minus small minus capital Q plus m2 small q. This capital Q cancels and you have M1 plus M2 you can take out and Q will be the factor and which you see is Q and that's what we started with. So let's go back here. Okay. So indeed what I have given as a result is correct. Now our 
um, goal is to find first the kinetic term potential term in terms of the generalized coordinates okay so that's what we'll do so you take t finding the lagrangian in uh, oops something something I've done how come let's see should be able to get rid of it it's not bothering us anyway so yeah I could cancel here okay so what yeah okay there is some Lagrangian in um, finding the Lagrangian L oops okay so something is wrong okay I think I know let's go to toolbar and I'm yeah now it's fine so L Q Q possibly T let's see whether there is a T here and of course uh, I should have written down Q dot capital Q dot and then T that's what we are doing right now I can remove this toolbar okay good okay so let's find out T now so your T is as before half m1 x1 dot square plus half m2 x2 dot square and let's substitute our x1 and x2 from here okay so do you get half m1 okay x1 dot square this will involve m1 plus m2 square in the denominator so let me write that down m1 plus m2 whole square okay and then your x1 dot square will have this piece uh, it will have q dot square plus m2 square q dot square minus 2 m2 q dot capital q dot okay so here you see that you have off diagonal terms also see this one is q dot q dot so it's a diagonal term q dot small q dot small q dot that's a diagonal term but small q dot with a capital q dot that's an off diagonal term um, let's uh, write down another the next term half m2 x2 dot square so I should look at this one now again you have m1 plus m2 whole thing squared in the denominator and then you have q dot square capital q dot square plus m1 square q small q dot square plus 2 m1 small q dot capital q dot okay let's see what we get when we add the two you see that the, these cross terms okay off diagonal terms so this will have m1 m2 this will have m2 m1 which is same as before and then you have small q dot capital q dot which is also here a factor of 2 and a factor of half which is also present here and they are opposite in sign so these two cancel okay so they go away and what you're left with is the following uh, let me just write it down what you're left is this left with is this half 1 over m1 plus m2 capital Q dot square plus half m1 m2 in the numerator and m1 plus m2 in the denominator and small q dot square that's what you're left with all the off diagonal pieces are gone that's good so let me write down the Lagrangian directly because u is simple so so my Lagrangian is um, half I'm writing that down again anyway let me write down q 
you got square plus half m1 m2 over m1 plus m2 q dot square minus u and what is u u is half k it has x2 minus x1 which is q small q okay q minus a a is a constant remember that square so that's what your lagrangian is that's what your lagrangian is okay of course i can um, redefine my small q and absorb that constant a which is sitting in the last term but uh, i'm not really bothered with that one so i'll leave it now uh, what's so nice about this lagrangian or what's so nice about the choice of coordinates that we have made can you spot something You see the capital Q does not appear in this Lagrangian, meaning Q, this capital Q is a cyclic coordinate. Okay, so that's that's what's so nice about the choice I have made. Q is cyclic. Okay, I hope you appreciate this. You could have. Uh, There's a phone call. Just again. You could have um, worked with the Cartesian coordinates. Which was fine; they were independent. But then neither of them, neither x one nor x two, is a cyclic coordinate. Okay, you could have worked with uh, the difference of the x one and x two, and the sum of x one and x two as the generalized coordinates. And if you do that exercise, you will find that you don't find any cyclic coordinate there as well. But if you make the choice which I have made now, you'll find that one of the coordinates is going to turn out to be cyclic, which is the case here. Okay. Um, that's good. That's very good. That's that's what uh, is good about our choice of coordinate. Anyhow, so you already know that if a coordinate is cyclic, then the corresponding generalized momentum is conserved, which means that um, let me go to the next slide. Which means that. the generalized momentum momentum corresponding to q okay is conserved conserved okay okay just a second please stay back please stay back okay uh, is conserved that's good so let's find out what that thing is okay so the generalized momentum pq is del l over del q dot remember this and what is del l over del q dot let's see this is the only place where um, this is the only place where q dot appears there is no other place and if you differentiate you'll get q dot over m1 plus m2 right so you get this is equal to q dot over m1 plus m2 which is same as what is q dot let me write down 1 plus m1 over m2 and what's q dot q dot is d over dt of q and what is q q2 is x2 sorry m2 x1 m sorry m2 x2 plus m1 x1 that's good which is d over dt of m2 x2 plus m1 x1 over m1 plus m2 right does this appear familiar okay this r or the quantity in the in the round brackets is the location of your center of mass okay the center of mass of your system is located at this place so all you are getting is that the the velocity with which the center of mass is going to move is a constant okay that's um, that's what it says which is true 
right and um just a second let me see what else i wanted to say okay so uh, you see you have got um, this result because of the symmetry that was present in in the in the system that if you take the entire system and move rigidly to some other place uh, the lagrangian would not change uh, i hope you can see that thing here the the first place when we wrote down the lagrangian here see uh, the u cares not about x2 and x1 individually it doesn't care where exactly x2 is where exactly uh, the second particle is or first particle is all it cares is about is the difference between those locations okay and here anyway uh, these are velocities so it doesn't care about what the locations are and that is why you are getting this conservation law that the center of mass is moving with uh, the constant speed which is also equivalent to saying that your total momentum of your system is conserved so if you look at this this numerator the numerator is just m2 v2 which is the momentum of particle number 2 m1 v1 which is the momentum of particle number 1 and that's the total momentum of your system which is conserved because the total time derivative of this is zero okay and this conservation law you have got because of the symmetry which we have in the system okay uh, that's one but also we have realized that um, a good choice of generalized coordinates will make this thing apparent okay and you will be able to identify or you will be able to um, make some of the coordinates cyclic depending on what the situation is okay let me uh, say a little bit more about the coordinates q and capital q okay imagine that you take that your system which has these two particles okay and this guy is here that guy is here which means the small q and capital q have some values now let's say i do something to the system i push this here and pull that one there so you have new x1 and x2 values which means you have new q and new capital small q and capital q values okay that's what uh, will happen if you change the coordinates now because small q and capital q are independent i can choose not to change the small q and change the capital q okay so that's the kind of uh, transformation what uh, uh, transformation that i want to look at so let's look at um a uh, a transformation where your q remains unchanged the small q unchanged and only capital q changes okay and i can do so because small q and capital q are independent if they were not then i could not have done this okay so let's see what i'm saying is i do some uh, i i move the two particles at different locations such that the change in q small q is zero which means x2 minus x1 does not change which means delta x2 minus delta x1 is zero or delta x2 is same as delta x1 okay and your capital q has changed now what does it mean that small delta x2 is same as small delta x1 meaning the change in the location of particle number 1 equals in the magnitude and direction both uh to the change in the location of particle number 2 which means that i have taken the entire system and moved both the particles by equal amounts in the same direction either this way or that way okay so as if i have taken the entire system and rigidly moved it from here to another location that's what uh, uh that's what it means and you see when i do so okay when i do so it does not matter what delta uh, what capital q is if i have chosen to keep small q to be zero then no matter what i do to capital q 
my Lagrangian does not change because that does not appear in the in the Lagrangian. Okay, and you should uh, check that capital Q just determines the. And anyway, we have seen it. It just determines the location of the center mass, right? It was m two x two plus m one x one. I mean, all that is missing is the denominator with total mass, which you can multiply. Okay, so uh, that is one thing which I wanted to say. Now, if you have an isolated system, okay, and with lots of particles in them, and you have a symmetry in the system, which means that you can take the entire system here or this way or that way, okay, things should not change. Then you should be able to choose your generalized coordinates in such a manner that you will get three cyclic uh, coordinates. Okay, and each will will correspond to a translation um, of the center of mass, either in the x direction or y direction or the z direction. Okay, that's um, that's good. That's um, so we have talked already about the conservation of energy that arises from prime prime translation symmetry. Then we have talked about conservation of momentum the total momentum of the entire system through this example which arises because of space symmetry and you can imagine that if we take a system which is again isolated from everything else and i rotate it about some axis okay then nothing should change the system should should not know that whether it is oriented like this or that and we should have a corresponding conservation law arising from um, um, such a symmetry and there should be a corresponding generalized coordinate which should be cyclic okay so that we will take up it in uh, take up in next video and um, yeah that's all what i have to say uh, in this one